Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I, it's unbelievable to see an organization like PAWS be so new and putting on an event at, of this caliber. Uh, I've been able to speak at a lot of other events before, and I just want to say thank you back to PAWS for, for everything and for what you're doing here. And it's much needed here in our valley. So um, I want to start you guys with just a little bit of an exercise, a little what we call a mindfulness exercise. And those of you who are familiar with mindfulness, it's about paying attention to and noticing what's going on outside around you, but also inside your body, in your mind, in your body physiologically. And so I'd like for you guys just to kind of consider and notice what goes on inside of you when you start with, oops, let me turn that on. When you start with this question. What's your secret? We all have them. Most of us carry secrets. Notice what goes on inside your body as you think about your secret. Where do you feel it? What are the thoughts that go through you? Maybe there's judgments about yourself or other people with it. Now notice how you feel when I ask you to just turn to your partner now and just share your secret with each other. <laughs> What's this about? <laughs> what, what was that? It's my daughter. No. It's my daughter. It's my daughter. Was, did, you guys, did you guys look around at each other when I said that second question? Like, what did you guys see in each other's faces? Yeah, there was like, it was like a combination of things. There were people that looked at me incredulously like, yeah, that's stupid. We're not going to do that. There were other people who totally just put their, their eyes on the floor and like, I'm not looking at anything. I'm not going to do anything here. And then the, the people who were really, really feeling awkward about it busted out in laughter, right? Because that's the only other release that we have, right? Because that would be crazy for us to turn and share our secret with somebody else, right? Because it's a secret for a reason. Um, Without having to share your secrets, what were some of the things that you experienced when you were thinking about your secrets? What did you notice? Uh, I felt obsessive. Obsessive. Okay. What else? Stomach. What happened in your stomach? Tightened, sick. How many of you guys got kind of that pit in your stomach, sick feeling? Did that come while you were thinking about your secret when I told you to share it? Thinking about it? Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, almost like there needed to be more protection for self. Okay. Yeah, maybe one more. Right here in my heart. You felt it in your heart? What did you feel in your heart? A sadness. Yeah. Okay, maybe a heaviness, tightness. How many of you guys got sweaty palms or got a, a, you know, like a flushed face? You notice those things go on? That's the body doing its job to try to teach us that there's certain things that are going to happen if we share our secret with somebody else. Right? So... I, I want to share one of my secrets with you today. <laughs> By the way, I want to say thanks to my wife. She's at the very back there today, too. She always comes and supports me. She has, to, she has to put up with these kind of like same topics over and over and over again, and somehow she still comes, so I appreciate it. But um, that's us 23 years ago on our wedding day. Everything looked perfect from the outside but I had already carried a secret into our newly begun marriage. <clears throat> From when I was 12 years old, I was exposed to pornography. When I was about 16 years old, I witnessed a pretty tragic event where one of my best friends fell off the school roof. And I ended up doing the first aid on him until the paramedics showed up and then he died the next morning. And I had already started to be curious about pornography and interested in pornography and it did something to my body as a young teenager and after that event happened I went into a deep deep dark depression I felt responsible for the death of my friend and it wasn't too far of a jump 
to cope with it in ways that I didn't know how else to do because I couldn't talk to anybody else. I had an image to maintain. My nickname in high school by my friends was The Prophet. My nickname from my teachers was Angel Boy. Other people's parents called me the All-American Kid. And so here I was as an example to everybody else around me, feeling responsible for the death of my friend and the only place that I could really find a turn was to pornography. And it became a really significant, pretty significant addiction in my life. And I kept it secret through everything. Nobody ever knew. And so I'd go to school and, and my life and church and I'd put on a certain face and then I'd come home so depressed and so sick of myself that I didn't know what to do with myself and I'd turn to pornography to get the medicine that I needed. And my wife thought she was marrying one person and she never knew about the second part. <coughs> if you guys are interested in my full story, you can go. I posted it on the internet on our website at Love Strong, but I won't share all the details. She didn't know for several years in our marriage. And there were things that were going on. She could feel that things were kind of different between us. She, there was a wall between us but she couldn't put her finger on it. And it wasn't until we had a few kids that she finally had the gut instinct to confront me about it. And we had what we call our D-Day. And that D-Day led to a long, <clears throat> excuse me. It led to a long and hard but absolutely beautiful road that we've been traveling ever since. So I'm not speaking to you today just as a therapist. To me, that's secondary. I'm speaking to you today that everything I'm gonna talk about comes from the life experience that we've lived together. And they're principles that I believe are principles of truth that can help anybody who finds themselves in a similar position. So most people worry about the acting out that happens. There's infidelity that happens. There's an affair that takes place. There's a secret addiction to pornography that's going on. And I'd like for you to think about the fact that those things that are going on are actually the symptoms of a deeper problem. And at the core on both sides for both partners, shame is usually at the root. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about shame. We're gonna talk about what happens when shame is going on inside of the relationship. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to climb out of the hole and unravel this thing that feels so confusing and difficult to get through sometimes. So shame, the definition of shame that we'll use is the Brene Brown definition. And those of you who are familiar with Brene Brown, she's kind of the guru on the topic of shame right now. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something that we've experienced, done, or failed to do make us, makes us unworthy of connection. So without having to raise your hands, how many of you have felt flawed to the point that if somebody saw it, you wouldn't be loved? It's a human condition. It's something we all deal with. It, we, we cannot avoid experiencing shame unless we're just complete psychopaths. It's, right, it's, it's part of being human, right? I like Carl Jung's definition because Carl Jung's kind of feels like more of the emotional definition for me. Shame is a soul-eating emotion. Simply shame feeds on itself. Shame survives in the darkest recesses of one's insecure, self-loathing, and self-doubting mind. Much like was, was mentioned earlier in the keynote, the best friend of shame is secrecy. Shame needs fear and negativity to survive. So looking at it from kind of a scriptural perspective, I personally believe that shame is the greatest tool of the adversary of this world and it's been around from the very very beginning 
You know, if we look at it from a biblical perspective, Adam and Eve are placed in the garden and they're placed in this place of what you might consider total innocence. Everything is sort of provided for them. They're given basically a couple of commandments of what they should be doing. And not very long after the garden is there and they're placed in the garden, there's another figure that comes into play. And who is that figure? Satan. Say that one more time. Satan. Satan. Satan enters as the, in, in the form of the serpent and begins to do what? It's, it's, it's actually temptation. And he finally gets the temptation to happen. Adam and Eve partake of the fruit. And what happens immediately after they partake of the fruit? He makes them shameful. He uses what I believe is his greatest tool and he makes them ashamed of, you said they're what? Ashamed of their bodies? Yes. He, he makes them ashamed of everything else too, right? What does he say? He says, quick, cover yourselves. You're naked. Hide. I would like for you to think about that in our world, that these secrets that you carry, the things that come the most, the most shame, the things that leave you the most compromised, those are the equivalent of the message that you're receiving from an adversary that's saying, quick, hide. You're naked. That, that's your nakedness. And Adam and Eve quickly disappear. They cover themselves up and they hide. And they believe what we call in our, in our therapy treatment, we call them false agreements. They're basically sometimes unconsciously done or sometimes consciously done, but they're handshakes with the devil where we agree to believe falsehoods about ourselves and about our lives and about our relationships. I am basically failure, weak, inadequate. Why couldn't I as a teenage kid go to my parents or go to my best friends and explain what was going on in my life? It was because by the time I had gotten there, I already believed something that was false, that they couldn't love me if they didn't see me as the all-American kid. That was my identity. That was where I was gonna get my value. I had to perform to get my value and that belief prevented me from being able to get the help that I needed, right? That's a false agreement. So how does shame work? Shame starts with the first belief. I am basically blank. You fill in your own blank. Think of that negative, the thing that's always in the back of your mind when you're alone or when you get bored, that's why we can't stand to be with ourselves or when you're in a situation where you're wondering what other people are thinking about you, I am basically blank. Weak, inadequate, unlovable, unworthy. We all have our favorites, right? My personal favorite is, is failure. I, I can't stand the thought of being a failure, right? That belief over time in our lives, we actually experience things that confirm that belief to be true. That's what we would call trauma. And those beliefs then reinforce that that must be true. And it leads to a second belief that says, if people really knew me, they won't love me. They won't accept me. They're going to judge me. And that fear of judgment leads us to put on masks. We become performers in our own lives as a result of the shame that we feel. And those masks can look lots of different ways. Sometimes they're overperforming masks. You know, that person at church that like is, you don't even know how they have a full-time job because they're always serving somebody else. Sometimes that's a mask to try to overcompensate for, the, for the, the darkness they feel inside. The person who puts on the happy face and jokes all the time and smiles all the time and you know, even around serious things can't get serious, that's the mask trying to perform your way into being accepted with other people, right? World's best parent. I mean, if you guys want masks, all you guys have to do is just check into your social media right now, right? I mean, that's, that's what social media is pr primarily for most people is just a way to present your mask, right? We perform and then we can't even accept the goodness of what we're doing because deep inside we think, if you only knew. So somebody comes up to, to me and says, Tyler, like you're one of the hardest working people or I know, or I oh, man, I love your spirituality. Could I just accept that and go like, thank you. 
with shame in the mix, no, I'd have to reject that, I'd have to renounce that, and deep inside I'd be like, I'd feel like a total hypocrite, right? And then it fuels what? More of the same first belief. The mask ends up leading to a feeling of isolation. Sometimes we're even surrounded by a lot of people, but nobody really ever gets in to see us or gets to know us. And, and so we feel alone. And that isolation is painful. We as human beings are wired for connection and attachment. We're wired that way. We can't avoid it. I was, I was out uh, deer hunting with my daughter this weekend. <laughs> we were hiking up this mountain. And she said to me, she said, Dad, I got a question for you. And I said, okay, well, what is it? And she said, why did God make me this way? And I'm like, what kind of talk are we going to have right now? Like, <laughs> where, where, are we, where are we going with this? And, and she said, how come when I'm around people, I just want to be alone, but every time I'm alone, I want to be around people? <laughs> I thought, man, that's how I feel too, a lot. Like, we can't avoid it. Like, what's the worst punishment you can give somebody? It's, it's solitary confinement, right? We, we can't survive without other people. And now the thing that we feel so compromised by makes us believe that nobody would want to be around us and then we perform but then we never actually get real connection because people don't get deep enough with us to actually know us right and that pain that we feel compounds on the life that we're living and now we live our normal lives and we get bored angry lonely tired stressed hungry we have a fight with our wives we lose our jobs and as life piles on top of us with the baseline of shame already there it leads us to the next cycle of next part of the cycle, which is the acting out part. We find ways to cope with our lives where we don't need anybody else. We all have our favorites, right? It could be pornography, sex, food, drugs, TV, social media, video games. Our world is replete with self-coping mechanism because we're unwilling or unable to actually go to the places where we could receive the real connection we need. And you know what, guys? Like, everyone's sitting here going like, oh, even being in this like, session right now, I need a Diet Coke, right? Like, just something to numb me out. Like, right? It's like, this stuff works, right? It works. Like, I know for a fact that if I go lose myself in pornography for a little while, the rest of the world goes away, I'll get the medicine, my brain will kick off with all the chemicals that I need to, and I'll get massive relief, and it'll feel good. And I know that consistently I can go to that thing. The only problem is the price that I have to pay on the back end for it. Right? So after the relief happens, we end up in a state of guilt, if we're lucky, or we feel numb. We numb everything out. And you can't selectively numb. If you numb all the bad stuff, you're going to numb all the good stuff. And so we feel guilt. Guilt is an emotion that I believe is a godly emotion. It's an emotion of movement and change. It says you did something that doesn't line up with who you are. You need to do something different. You need to change. But instead, what we do is we convert, convert guilt into shame. And then that shame becomes its own form of a spiral. And pretty soon we're going down this negative spiral where we start to do things and engage in things that we thought we would never do. And then we're looking up out of a big dark hole going, how did I get here? And then we try to dig ourselves out by doing what? Numbing out, feeling guilty, turning it into shame, and, and then telling ourselves we're going to be better until we're not again. Right? That's the cycle that's actually going on when you're dealing with any form of an addiction. And most people only want to look at the acting out part. And I'd submit to you that the actual way out of this is to learn to break the cycle at the I am, the mask, and the isolation parts instead of just the acting out parts. Acting out is just sobriety. We're just going to make you not do those things again. So basically what we're going to say to somebody is, your life is unmanageable to the point that you can't live without it. We're going to take your medicine away and we're not going to teach you how to actually deal with the things that are going on in your real life. And real recovery is actually attacking the whole cycle. 
So when you've got two people who are operating from a place of shame, you've got these secrets that have been going on for a while, it turns into a cycle where both of us in our own cycle actually amplify the disconnection inside of a marriage. And so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the dance of disconnection that goes on, at least in the, with many of the clients that I work with. By the time they get into my office, this cycle that we're going to talk about is moving pretty naturally. So it starts with him. And, and again, we could, we could change roles here, but I'm going to use him as the one who's either had the infidelity or the addiction and her as the one who's been betrayed. Okay. Um, his cycle starts with the mismanagement of shame and pain like we talked about. So you have that whole cycle going on underneath it already. And then the part that you might be able to see is this other cycle. It's called the addiction cycle. And it starts with when my life gets too hard, my brain turns on to what I need to do to cope. So I start thinking about my favorite things. You know, I was joking about like the Diet Coke right now, but <laughs> there's a reason why there's like a traffic cop outside of Swig every day at around 3 p.m., <laughs> right? And it's because everybody in their car is at that part of the day where they're low on energy, they're stressed about their kids coming home from work or what they're gonna do for the night, and they roll through Swig to get their medicine to get through the rest of the day, right? That's preoccupation. The, the brain and the body kick in, it's like a magnetic pull. It's like, oh, I gotta have that. Or man, I wish I could just get home for me to watch TV tonight. Or what's, what's on the docket for the shows I'm gonna watch tonight? Like, and as the brain starts to preoccupy, it opens the body and kind of turns on that urge that you need it. It tells your body that you need it, that you might even die if you don't get it, right? That leads to rituals. And rituals are all of the things that we set up in order to get to the acting out part. So if I'm, if I'm a pornography addict and I'm trying to not do it, but then I am gonna do it, I might have a set of rituals where I wait for my wife to be gone. She's gone late to school tonight, I can be alone on the computer. I'm not really gonna act out yet, I'm just gonna get on and check social media and watch a few YouTube videos and check my email but then something pops up on the sidebar that's a little bit questionable and I click that, but it's not a big deal until it is a big enough deal for me to feel guilty enough about it to say, oh, I've already messed up. And then I go to my place. Every one of those things that I just did is actually part of the ritual and the brain is using it to build the anticipation to get to the acting out part of it once I've built the pattern, right? Where we are creatures of pattern, our brains are built that way to save energy. So we want to understand what those rituals are in order to start to break things long before the acting out. So I, when I was getting early into my own recovery, I couldn't say I'm not going to look at porn. For me, what I did was to not have the internet on any of my devices. So I had no internet on my phone. I didn't watch a single YouTube video for three or four years because YouTube was my window into the porn some of the time. And it was enough of a pattern that my brain I couldn't stop my brain from going there, right? So breaking the cycle earlier is more helpful than trying to break the cycle at the end. So you've got that cycle that's going on. A lot of times inside of a marriage where the partner is not even aware that it's going on yet. But the partner, well, I better not, uh, let me just finish this one first. Um, I love this quote, uh, all sins our attempts to fill voids because we cannot stand the God-sized shaped hole inside of us. And we try stuffing it full of all sorts of things, but only God may fill it. Addiction is an attachment disorder. And in many cases, in most cases with the clients that I work with, there is simultaneously a wrestle for sobriety and recovery at the same time that there's a wrestle with God. An understanding of who God is and how, who I am in God's eyes. And I love that quote about addictions being a God-sized hole that we're trying to fill, right? Because ultimately what we end up doing is we end up worshiping whatever it is we pursue, right? So our drug of choice becomes our God, right? So for a partner, before she even knows what's going on, she feels something. There's a feeling of instability. Where are we at time? We're we doing 20. Okay. 
there's a feeling of instability. There's kind of this like question of like something's wrong or off, but I don't know what it is. And then oftentimes when she finds out, she's already got her own base level of shame and pain. And then it leads to this kind of like fear and trauma response when it all breaks loose. You know, she finds out, she sees some emails from her partner, her partner's affair partner, or she stumbles into the computer history and goes, whoa, like what's happening in my world right now? I didn't know my husband was into these things. And that goes from that feeling of instability to a massive roller coaster of emotions, massive trauma response for many, many people. Um, what else don't I know? I can't sleep. I'm having bad dreams. I'm not eating okay. I can't function with other people. I don't know who I can talk to anymore now because I want, kind of want to protect my partner, but I also don't need some support, but I also don't want to be judged if I choose to stay. Like all this stuff starts to kick in for her. And it's like a massive roller coaster of emotion. And in many cases, what's really sad about this is, is that just her finding out starts to make her look like the crazy one in the relationship, even yeah. though it's based off of the fact that the main core of her world has just pull, been pulled out from underneath her. The core of trust in the relationship, that core need of needing to be connected and have a safe person or a safe place is now in question. That leads to obsession. The brain can't turn off. The brain starts thinking, what if, woulda, shoulda, coulda, this, that, the other. If I was just pretty enough, if we just had sex more, um, I should have checked up more. What if I drive by his office every single hour, just on the hour, just to check on him? Like all of that stuff and that obsession drains the tank emotionally. So the partner who's been betrayed is managing this trauma response, but the, the emotional tank goes to empty. And when the tank goes to empty, the emotional response gets bigger. And so she's still floundering around trying to find stability in her situation. And it leads to control. She will sometimes try to control others. You know, she might go, I'm going to save my husband. I'm going to reach over. I'm going to, I've already set an appointment for him for his therapist. I've already put, you know, blockers on his internet. In fact, I just went and smashed his phone, like whatever that is, like I'm going to fix him so that I can feel safe. Right. Or oftentimes it goes inside and she says, you know, obsessive cleaning or sometimes eating disorder kinds of problems, control types of things. Or if I was just, if I just have sex with him every day, then he won't go out somewhere else. Like, that's an internal control that goes on, but ultimately both forms of control lead back to the same place. I'm tired of being his probation officer. I want to be his partner, not his mother. I'm exhausted. I'm still failing, especially if his cycle keeps going and she's trying to fix him. I'm still failing. Okay. So this is an excerpt from a poem from one of my current clients that gave me permission to share this. Um, it's a beautiful poem, but I think it sums it up with what, what a lot of people betrayed partners feel. Something is missing. It's gone, disappeared. Was it stolen or lost? I question in fear. I've lost something precious. What could it be? My heart cries out. It's the ability to be me. And, and that reaches into all other parts of life. It causes questions with God. If I was living so worthily and I married this person that God told me to marry, why would he do that to me? Right? Um, it causes problems socially. I can't go hang out with my friends anymore. I might not even be able to help hang out with some of my friends because they're part of the equation, right? Um, my whole life changes. And so you're left floundering in kind of this washing machine of fear and doubt, trying to find a way to plant your feet. And it leads to this kind of dance. So now, I start to see my wife get a little bit edgy on things and see that the trauma response is happening. So I get kind of weird or I start to pull away. And then I use that to blame her for causing me the pain so I can justify wanting to go act out. And then when I act out, of course, it hurts her again. And eventually what we've got is this sort of like dance of disconnection where we're each in our own cycle and we're unwilling to see how it's actually affecting each other in the relationship. And what I can say from my own recovery process is, is that one of the biggest, most pivotal places of my own recovery was a time when 
my wife left me. She was just fresh after D-Day. She had just found out about things. She didn't know what to do. She needed some space away from me. And we happened to be driving on the highway next to each other for about an hour. She was going down to New Mexico from Idaho where we lived and I was going from Idaho Falls to Pocatello and we were back and forth on the inter interstate. And I kept looking over and I could just see kind of her side profile and I could see two little sets of pigtails of my little girls in the back. Couldn't even see their faces. And right as I went to exit, my wife looked over at me through the window and I thought I'd see a look of just pure hatred and disgust and anger. And what I saw instead was a shattered heart. I saw brokenness. I saw pity. And when I saw that look in her eyes, I recognized that my problems were not just about me. That I could not afford to affect the people in my life that I love the most and that I was actually affecting their lives even if I thought I had a secret. And that was one of the biggest pivotal changes for me is, is that this was more than just about me. I could finally see her a little bit, right? So, so how do we shatter the cycle? It starts with, at our practice, we use the idea of connection in three ways. And it's based off of the scripture in Matthew chapter 22. I love this scripture. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. When we're in a place of shame, we can't even consider loving God because we're so worried about not being loved by God. Right? Thou shalt love thy neighbor. And this is interesting. I love the, the language for this. As thyself. So if I'm going to be in recovery, I have to love God, which means I have to know who God is to me. I have to love myself because I have to receive that love from God. And then I have to love my neighbor because that's what I do when I know who I am. That's the process of recovery is connection in three ways. Connection with God, connection with self, heart and mind, learning to live in actual reality rather than trying to disappear and connecting with other people, learning to take the masks off, learning to be authentic, honest, transparent, empathetic. And when I live a life like that, I don't need to act out. I have a life worth living. So we teach three recoveries in our practice. There's his recovery, her recovery, and our recovery. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the real quick basics that we start people with in our recovery <coughs> process. The first one is the cultivation of humility. And I like this definition of humility because I think humility is completely misunderstood in our world today. Most people think of humility and humility is actually tied to shame. If somebody comes to me and says, Tyler, like that was a great presentation. I have, and if I'm going to be humble, what do I have to do? I could have done way better. Like, you're so kind, but I, that was actually really terrible. That was horrible, right? Is that humility? I don't think so. I think humility is actually coming to an accurate understanding and acceptance of everything God says we are. So the humble person actually knows, it goes right along with the word meekness, and meekness, I love this definition of meekness, is someone who has a sword and knows how to use it, but chooses to keep it in its sheath. Somebody who's humble also knows who they are in God's eyes for the positives and is willing to accept those things and to light that candle and show it to the world. And they're also willing to accept their weaknesses as the possibility of continued growth. That's humility. And so we want to cultivate that through self-compassion, through a wrestle with God, through an understanding of what your strengths are in addition to the weaknesses that you're currently trying to work on. Team is absolutely imperative. This is one of the hardest things to get clients to do is to build a team. They need a place where they can get a couple of main components inside the team. 
And this is what something like group therapy is really, really beneficial for because a good group will do both. They need to be accepted and loved and shown empathy and they need someone to push them to change. They need both, they need accountability. And so building a team, and you can get that through lots of places, good family members, church leaders are like, church leaders are like one of the first lines of defense. A really good church leader goes a really long way. Sorry, thinking about some of my clients, like when they have the right church leader who knows some of this stuff, it helps them so, so much. Um, we, we teach a concept called dailies, and dailies are the sort of like nuts and bolts kind of pursuit of the cultivation of an experience with your heart every day. Spiritual practices, exercise, hobbies, passions, things that give you purpose. You've got to be engaged in those every single day because you're, that's how you're going to cultivate the life that's worth living. And it's a lot better to live in recovery when you're looking forward and creating a life than it is to just run from the chasing you. And then the last one is something we call bottom lines. And this is the practical part of breaking that cycle, the habit loop that the brain's doing. I have to change the way that I live. If I act out in certain ways, I need to change certain patterns about my life. And that's where bottom lines come in. So I don't watch YouTube anymore. I do now, 15 years, 16 years later, but for three or four years, I didn't watch YouTube because my brain was too attached to it for the wrong reasons. That's what bottom lines are. The interrupters to the habit cycle, the loop that goes on. For her recovery right off the bat, the first thing that she's looking for and needs is emotional safety. And so helping her to establish that, if that means she needs some time away from her partner in order to kind of get her feet planted and grounded again, if she needs to set certain boundaries for herself to be able to, to kind of be as normal as possible and getting through the rest of the day with work or kids or whatever else is on the plate, um, she needs emotional safety. It goes along with that grounding emotionally. So we teach some just kind of like trauma-based physiological grounding skills and techniques that go along with that. And then she needs to start re-understanding and clinging to her core values. A lot of times she starts to lose her sense of self and she starts to lose the values that are important to her, fidelity, respect, trust, whatever those things are. And a lot of times in a state of trauma, she's actually willing to sacrifice those values to try to save a marriage but now she's stepping off into the sickness, trying to save a marriage rather than standing true in the principles that will actually have the potential to save the marriage. And she also needs a team, support. And it's sad because a lot of times I hear this like from my clients, I'll have a, like, a, like one of the guys come in and say, is your wife coming in with you? No, 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 she said it's my problem, I need to, well, how's she doing? She can barely get out of bed every day. Unfortunately, it's not her fault. It's not her fault, but, but she still needs help. She still needs a team. And we all do better when we have empathy and when we have a push for change. And then self-care goes along with dailies. A commitment to fill the tank emotionally every day because we know that your emotional tank will be on full draw. And the more empty you get, the worse life gets. So anything you can do to put in some emotional energy into the tank, sleeping properly, proper nutrition, taking a nap, a hot bath. You know, I know what kind of day it is with like in my house when I hear the bath turn on for like the fourth time and my wife's climbing in, I'm like, oh, it's, it's one of those days, you know? So, um, and then she needs space to wrestle with God. One of, the, one of the hardest things for a partner who's fresh into betrayal to hear is in the very first appointment with an, with like an ecclesiastical leader or a therapist, they look that person in the eye and go, you got to forgive them, right? I guarantee you most partners who are fresh into betrayal aren't ready to be at the end of the process of forgiveness. They're barely trying to breathe. And if you can give them space to do the wrestle, that space to do the wrestle is really valuable. Permission to maybe be angry to be confused, to be sad, to feel abandoned. That wrestle actually has the potential to yield really amazing results if there's space to do it. 
and then you've got our recovery. Most people come into my office and they want this to happen before the other two happen and it doesn't work that way very often. They usually happen in conjunction with each other. And so the principles of our recovery, and this is very high level stuff, we could do a whole other presentation just on this part, uh, is building trust. And the, the recipe to building trust on a high level is consistent effort and action with empathy over time. And time is the key word here. So if I've been sober for two weeks and I'm like, why don't you trust me yet? Like, number one, is sober is sobriety the actual measuring stick of trust? No, so, sobriety is a part of it. Com and then added to it is humility, transparency, openness, effort, change, right? All of that over time will yield trust over time. As you work on yourselves, that his and hers part, that actually builds the platform of trust to be reestablished. Empathy is the ability to step into the other person's shoes and actually see the world from their perspective. And both partners have a really difficult time with this, especially at the beginning. But as they grow, empathy is a skill. It's not something everybody's just naturally good at. It's a skill that can be learned. And I believe that empathy is the greatest superpower in the world. If you want to get anything in this world, if you master the skill of empathy, you can have just about anything you want. Zig Ziglar is one of my favorite speakers, and he says, uh, he says, what's his famous line is, you can have everything you want in this world if you just help enough other people get what they want. And if you look at this world, empathy is the thing that we're all starved of. I joke with my brother, he's a therapist, and I say that I could have no skills as a therapist other than empathy and I could keep my practice completely full. People will pay whatever you wanna charge them if they walk out feeling understood. <clears throat> The practice of vulnerability, taking off the masks with one another, having space with each other to learn to practice taking off the masks and letting each other truly be seen. It's a sad world we live in where people have to perform their way into convincing the person they think that they want to be with to marry them, and then they try to hide from each other for the next 50 years. It's like, <laughs> it's like why do we do that? What would happen if we were just authentic in the first place, we would actually match ourselves up with the very right person for us. And so because most of us do it backwards, we get the chance of practicing this a little bit at a time. That leads to the process of amends and forgiveness, which comes usually a lot later on, and it's a process. And then that leads to deeper intimacy and connection. So I wanna just end with a couple of things here. This is a song that was written by a former client. He wrote it from the perspective of what he thought his wife might have been going through through their process. So the reason I wanna share this is because he's showing empathy um, to her, but it's also kind of speaking really well to what I think a lot of partners feel, so. I just end with this last thought for you. I've got four daughters. They have absolutely been worth fighting for and whatever fight it takes is worth every bit of it. I welcome every one of my daughters to marry a man who is in recovery because they do make the best kinds of husbands and fathers when they figure out how to live with humility and transparency. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm.